Lord God, Heavenly Father, you delivered us from the enemy through the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom we are united in holy baptism. Continue to deliver us, we pray, from our diseases and afflictions by your merciful gift of healing as you feed us holy food and give us the cup of everlasting life to drink. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beautiful prayer, uh, focusing on Holy Baptism and, of course, the Lord's Supper. Last week we covered Holy Baptism. And now we have concerning the Lord's Supper. You may be surprised in the Augsburg Confession this article is not longer. And I'll quick give you the, the bottom line answer to it is the Roman Catholic Church, even though it hadn't yet quote-unquote, been formalized by Council of Trent, really had no problems with it. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just communicating some, you could say, misinformation, and there was another nuance, but they would that would come up a little bit later, as John mentioned last week, about communion in both kinds, both bread and wine, versus uh, one or the other. Uh, I'll just sort of add that, but let's just, let's dive into what, the first of all, the confessions say. Paragraph one, concerning the Lord's Supper, it is taught that the true body and blood of Christ are truly present under the form of bread and wine in the Lord's Supper and are distributed and, as you can see my bold, large, italicized print, received there. So what do you receive? Four things, the bread, the wine, the body, and the blood of Christ, okay? So those four things are articulated, and those four things are received. Plain and simple. Where do we get this notion from? Well, we take the words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, take, eat, this is my body, and he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So there you have it. Jesus is saying, this bread is his body. This wine is his blood. Comes some of the disagreement. Is that possible for Christ to be truly present? That's the struggle that many are, are challenged with. Like I said, um, the, the, when this article was read, there was really no debate. What the debate uh, uh, would come up a little bit later was uh, uh, about this is whether um, in the Roman Catholic circles, they believe that in the bread alone, you have the true body and blood of Christ. And so you don't necessarily need to be handing out the wine to the people. But I have one other Bible passage to kind of pair with this, okay? From John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And you might be thinking, what does this have to do with the Lord's Supper? Notice what's going on here. God is taking on flesh yes. and blood and dwelling among you to be with you. What happened in the previous verse that we were talking about? God is saying, I'm taking on this bread and wine to be among you, more than just be among you, to be consumed by you. I okay. I have a question. Oh, we have tons of questions. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Hold on a second. So the, the main teaching point is, this is what God says. This is what we believe. This is what we teach. We try not to rationalize it. Because if God can, if, let me just back to John chapter 1, verse 14. If God can take on human flesh and blood, he can certainly, as the confessions say, Whoops. are truly present under the form of bread and wine. And this is important because there are many, as paragraph two, 
rejected, therefore, is also the contrary teaching. Well, what's the contrary teaching? Anything else. Yeah. So if you don't believe the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, are truly present, and, let me just back up, I'm sorry, I'm bouncing all over the place, and you receive it, you consume it. I know we usually don't talk that way. We go into church on Sunday and we consume the body and blood of Christ. It sounds like we're cannibals. But it's interesting, the early Christian church was actually kind of wrongly accused of being cannibalistic. They're going to church on Sunday and they're eating flesh and they're drinking blood. Well, yeah, the body and blood of Christ, that's true. But you can always, if you, that's why you need to say under the form or in, with, and under is like the way we usually like to teach that, the bread and the wine. And so that's why four things need to be present. Okay. And uh, last little Bible passage, and then I'll try to take some of your questions. Let me bring this in from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28. Paul wrote, let a person examine himself then. And so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Okay, so when we get to this point of reject, people who reject four things present or the body and blood of Christ with that bread and wine, okay, and they come up with some other thing that God cannot be present with that bread and wine, that he's up there in heaven, he can't be present. Unfortunately, that's a major teaching. Uh, we sit there and say, what does Paul say? You need to be able to discern the bread, Dis I mean, discern the body, uh, eat and drink. Uh, if you don't discern the body, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. And he then even equates that with physical illness and death. There's a lot more going on here than just receiving bread and wine. But unfortunately, there are many churches that teach it's just bread and wine. It doesn't matter. Paul says otherwise. Okay, so now I'll try to take some of your questions. John. Uh, I got an answer to that last question. Okay. That's a psychological problem that, that people that do what you said, that is why they are weak and ill. These people use yet preconceived notions. But let's go back to the first part. Okay. Uh, I, want to, I want you to go the back first to the first, first, the first, thing, the first, first paragraph. Thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, that isn't the first one. That was what, that's what I started with. You want Matthew 26? Well, distributed to the disciples. One before that. Matthew 26, I think he's Yeah, the Matthew 26. So the, the words of institution. Verse, yeah. uh, broke it and gave it to his disciples right now this is jesus christ doing it mm -hmm. okay who at that particular point are the disciples and were there any women present yeah, the scriptures do not mention that any women were, were pres present and so as you heard in today's sermon okay um i i related it to the feeding of the twelve Okay. Besides the feeding of the 5,000. I haven't done that before, but I was trying to make some comparison point. So let's just assume just 12. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, but, but Jesus Christ did not make any uh, distinction for men or women at that point. This is we just the 12. Disciples. This is just the 12. This is just the disciples. Did he ever distribute communion to a woman? Uh, no. So he died. Yeah, he never did. He died. After he, after he instituted after this, he died hours later. Okay. <laughs> where, 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 where I think your mind is wanting to go, so let me help you with this, John. Uh, we're a little outnumbered here. I need help. Okay. And, and so let me, let me kind of just add one little interesting nuance to this discussion. Depending on which one of the evangelists you're reading, um, Judas could have been at the table. Mm -hmm. So Judas would have received the body and blood of Christ. 
And we don't have a problem with Judas receiving the body and blood of Christ because A, it's in scripture, uh, and B, the forgiveness of sins is there for him. But did Judas truly understand the forgiveness of sins and the body and blood of Christ? There's That's one. where the debate can come into, and we'll talk about that in a little bit of a later article, not directly about Judas, but how faith needs to receive the benefits. Without faith, you're not receiving the benefits. Is That's that where you're key. Talking about Corinthians, the judgment on himself, is that where... It would that be a participant of Judas that's then? That's that last sentence. That's, that's part of that discerning of the body and blood of Christ, yes. Okay, I think, Craig, I think I saw your hand back there for a moment. Yeah, I, I, isn't there, isn't there something before this where it says he was celebrating Passover with the Twelve? Correct. And then we've all seen the picture of the painting, so we all know it's just that all Twelve were there. Yeah, that was a, that was a photo, right? <laughs> well, it was a painting from a photo. A painting from a photo. Thank you for that. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't have roll call attendance. Sorry. I mean, wouldn't it be nice, you know, if you would have had a drone uh, flying around <laughs> capturing all of this so that we could sit there and take attendance? There was Judas, there was Matthew, there was John, there's all the rest of them, and just ch go through the check list, but we don't. But remember, the purpose of Scripture is to what? To show you Jesus is your Savior, not to give you a point-by-point -point itinerary of the life of Christ while he was here walking on the earth, but to show you that, yes, Jesus is your Savior. That's the point of Scripture. And yes, it is correct, okay? So I'm not trying to say it's not correct. I'm just going to say it's not going to be completely exhaustive. But does, the, does it make the point? And the answer is yes. But does everyone who read it believes it? The answer is no. Then that becomes because of faith. And so um, that's why sometimes people will struggle with all of this. But in the midst of the struggle, the church needs to continue to teach. Okay, John? The distinction you just gave me was the fact that if uh, other faiths believe in God, they don't have this distinction of the body and blood given to Correct. them. So that's a complete distinction of, of other people's faith. Then, that, now we're going into this passage, okay? And I think uh, Londa uh, last week... Uh, when we were introducing the Lord's Supper, she made a comment about, oh good, then we can talk about close communion. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, I, okay. I, I wanna do, I had a question. That yeah, okay, so let, yes. let's bring it up in connection with this. So we practice in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, what we call close or closed communion. And what we mean by that is we just don't open the doors for communion for everyone. There have been times I've said to people, <laughs> Please don't commute, okay? Why would I ever do that? Here's my reasoning why, right here. Uh, for anyone who eats or drinks without discerning the body, that's what I'm looking for. Because I am well aware of many churches and many more that do not teach that Christ is physically present with that bread and wine uh, than those that do. So I already know uh, if you survey and get 100 people together uh, who are Christians, my guess is, based on church populist numbers and stuff, most of them will not believe that Christ is physically present with the bread and wine. And But yet, this is what we believe, this is what we teach, this is what we confess, and so it's like, the discussion goes like this, please respect our beliefs, it's different, do not commute. If you'd like to talk more about this, by all means, please feel free to do so. Okay? And this is where some of the struggles come in, is we want people to be connected to Christ. And my goal is not trying to disconnect people from Christ. However, there's something more at stake on whether I'm making people happy or not. Yeah. What's at stake? people eating and consuming judgment on themselves. So Paul is very clearly saying, you gotta believe that Christ is bodily present. If not, you're not believing the promises of God and you're doing that to your own judgment, Wanda. So one of my 
the question I actually had last week was, so if we go to another church, right? can we take communion since we believe that it's his body and blood or because they don't present it that oh. way? Is that uh, something mm -hmm. we should not do? Okay, so now, now let me rephrase your question a little bit, and I'm hoping I'm still articulating it. But I'm going to rephrase it just so that uh, we can, I think we can talk about it a little bit better. Is it about my faith and what I believe? Or is it about the local community's faith and what they believe? Those are two different things. Yeah. Okay. Because when it comes to individuals, individuals may believe the body and blood of Christ, but the church publicly will deny that. Then my question is, why do you go to that church? Okay. I'm just thinking maybe you're visiting. So. Okay. And, okay, so now comes the better question is if somebody sees you and sees you participating, are they also not seeing you then in agreement with what that church teaches? Or are you wearing a big placard sign, you know, on the, with the front and the back? that says, I actually believe Christ is present with that bread and wine, okay? And you're making that as a statement as you're going up there for communion mm -hmm. or, or as communion mm -hmm. comes to you in the trays and the, uh, the pews as that's sometimes often celebrated. And so we basically kind of say, I would rather have my members not commune and commune at a place that understands the body and blood of Christ being bodily present because it's more than just this, it's actually how you actually kind of look at all of Scripture. So I've actually said over the many years in my as a pastor, it, it's not a, a very scriptural thing, but it's just a very honest where I believe that if the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod or Lutheran Church period just disappeared off the face of the earth, so to speak, just imploded and no longer present, and I had to go find another church home per se, most churches I could not walk into. I've actually put that number as high as like 95%. Uh -huh. Okay. And I'm sitting there going, why, why would I have such a high quality control? And unfortunately, because I'm, I understand the scriptures and I'm like, this is not what scriptures teach. And it would just constantly drive me nuts. So that's why I couldn't belong to a church unless it had faithfully taught that. And as we dive into scripture more, we will see that more. Uh, so the more we dive into scripture, the more we understand scripture, the more we're gonna sit there and say, there's a lot of churches that are not quite getting it right. Okay, fair enough, no church is perfect. Not even our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregations, we're not perfect either. Okay, so now comes how much quality control do you need to have to find a church? So is it one that has to be 99.9% .9 perfect? That would be ideal, okay? But you're not gonna find that. But scripture is very clear about the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper, the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. And because of that, this is something that I personally, as you can probably tell, if you listen to my Bible studies and sermons and so forth, you know I hang on to this very, very well this Lord's Supper and saying, I want to cherish that. And anyone who takes that away from me, I'm going to, like Paul, put them in a different category. Uh, okay, Jim. I, I, I just wanted to go back for a minute to, to the, the number of apostles there or okay. who was present. And, and I think I'm, I'm with Craig. I, th I think that scripture really throws us a couple of hints that it definitely was only to 12. And I kind of believe that for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. I think these final few hours was Jesus' climax right. of yeah. such intimate and personal teaching right. with these 12 that it was so important, you know, that it's just them. But I think the hidden message under there is also the hint that Jesus intends church leadership to be male. Yep. And I do agree with that. And yep. I think that's just one of a number of examples in the Bible of his intent. Of, and that's no disregard to females. I think he's putting the pressure on the males to say, I expect you to be the leaders. 
expect you to stand up and take uh, responsibility. Okay. Uh, you, we will see that, hang on to that, those thoughts. We're going to see that a little bit later uh, with one of the articles that says who is who's allowed to do the public teaching and the public distribution of the sacraments. And we're not gonna to get to it today, but it's actually in the deck, so you've already done the advanced work. It's coming up soon, it's coming up soon. Okay, uh, Janet. Someone said to me that believing that that is the true body and blood of Christ is like crucifying him over and over. Okay, now th that that's a valid statement if you belong to a Roman Catholic church. Mm -hmm. It's called the resacrifice of the mass. Okay, that they believe that every time they celebrate the mass, they are resacrificing the body and blood of Jesus, uh, and that's in the Roman Catholic um, uh, viewpoint. Uh, but now let's let's just let me just go back to what we said here in this article. Because the reaction to the Roman Catholic Church in the confrontation was they agreed with this. They had an extra little disclaimer to it that we would actually then, it was a lead into what was going to come up to one of the other things. They said they would agree with this, uh, with the idea that when you got to the bread, that the bread contained both the body and the blood. Of Christ because eventually they're going to get to the point and say we're gonna drop off the wine for the lay people okay and that's gonna come up in another article as we talk about communion in both kinds so I'm saving a lot of stuff for there and thank you Don for giving me that stuff because it's a beautiful mm -hmm. lead into it so I'm gonna say hold on to that this is just gonna whet your appetite for it mm -hmm. as we eventually will get there uh, but they or they, they said they agreed with this Okay, with the one little caveat that the bread uh, is the body and blood of Christ. And so when you get to that communion of both kinds, they had no problems with saying, we're only going to give you the bread. It has both the body and blood of Christ. Next. And we'll talk about some of our disagreements with that. But at the moment, with this, we are in agreement. Now, there, there's a reason why we're not going yes. for everything underneath this subject level. Remember, we are, there, there was some disagreement between Lutherans and, Roman, and what would later become the Roman Catholic Church. And so in the matter of this disagreement, let's, say, let's hammer out, first of all, what can we agree to? What can we shake hands on? What can we sit there and say, we're in agreement with this. We're in agreement with this. We're in agreement with this to help build that unity so that when we get to the, some of the points where we're not in agreement, we at least have a common background that we can build upon. And so that's why you're gonna get the both kinds coming up a little bit later. Yes, John. We're talking about like an aftermath of Jesus and what he did on, on earth. When Jesus was here, he forgave a lot of people. Now what happened to those people if they failed them? To believe afterwards. Oh, we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Yeah. Honest, honest, honest. It's coming into it, but let me articulate I mean, he your blessed, question. He blessed a lot of people. Your, your question is, let me rephrase it this way. Is it possible for a believer to fall away? Well, that's ultimately that question. And that's actually going to be brought up in the uh, confession. So just be a little patient. We're going to get there. But I'm glad you're thinking along those lines because you're you're, you're flowing the you're flowing well, along the natural logic of what's going on to here. Jesus himself. Um, but actually, let's let's start entertaining some of this, okay? Uh, and let's go to the next one. You ready? Mm. So after the Lord's Supper, what's the next one? Confession. 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 Um, concerning confession. It is taught that private absolution should be retained and not abolished. However, it is not necessary to enumerate all misdeeds and sins, since it is not possible to do so. Okay, Psalm 19, verse 12, for which says, but who can detect their errors? So there is a reason why they had to put this in there, because the rumor mill was going around 
Okay, and we all know not to believe in the rumor mill, but you know, where the rumor mill captures our attention, that these Lutherans were abolishing pr pr private confession and absolution. Well, guess what? I could probably state this case better now than back then. They did not abolish private confession and absolution. However, how well do we teach it? And I will admit, I probably need to do a better job in teaching the benefits of private confession and absolution uh, because we don't do this regularly and maybe we should. So let's unpack this a little bit more, okay? And find out what's going on in here. Uh, and let me just use a couple of uh, Bible passages. First of all, from John chapter 20, verse 22. And when Jesus had said this, he breathed on them. This is referring to the disciples post-resurrection and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Okay, so Jesus very clearly is teaching, especially the disciples. And I know we were talking about, is this the 12? More than likely, it probably is. Uh, and again, no roll call attendance, but uh, let's just go with the 12. Um, and is uh, giving them the directive to forgive sins. Now, to be fair, all Christians have that power to forgive sins, okay? So I don't want, you know, your neighbor to come to you and, you know, uh, apologize to, for something that they did wrong and for you to sit there and say, well, I can't forgive you. Only my pastor can forgive. No, no you go ahead and you forgive your neighbor. Okay, mm -hmm. plain and simple. Okay, but now let me go to some Old Testament, an Old Testament uh, verse. From Leviticus chapter 26, and sorry for the finer print here, verse 40. But if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, and at this point, for those who are in the Thursday Bible study on Nehemiah, I hope that you're like, ooh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's what Nehemiah was focusing on. And the iniquity of their fathers and the treachery that they have committed against me and also in walking contrary to me so that I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised heart is humbled and they make amends for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and I will remember my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land. So notice what God is doing here. He's talking about confession of sin being a key to this relationship piece. You confess we're in relationship. You don't confess you're not in relationship. Okay? Uh, and realizing it's just not picking up what we were talking about before, about is it an individual faith? You know, can I go to a church that doesn't believe the Lord's Supper and still partake of what they call the Lord's Supper uh, versus a corporate faith by saying, no, I shouldn't? Notice that there, we're not just confessing my sins. No, 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 no. And the iniquity of their fathers, previous generation, other people's sins. Okay? So there is a corporate nature, not just a me and Jesus nature. Question. So is that why we, when we do confessions of sins, I mean, we're saying our sins privately to God, right? But then corporately, we're all doing it at the same time, and you're giving us absolution. So isn't, or are they saying you can only do private as a one-on-one? -on -one? No, they're not saying you can only do private. They're saying we're not going to get rid of the option of private. Okay? So now, now this is where I will admit sometimes as Lutherans, we, you will find people on both sides. So let me kind of give you a little bit of a historical piece. Um, and all of you are probably too young for this to have occurred. So more than likely, you would have been talking to a grandma or a grandpa. Okay? And they would have said, you know, I remember in the Lutheran church, before we would come to take communion, we would meet with the pastor individually and confess our sins, and then we announced that we're gonna take communion, and we would receive absolution, and then we were able to take communion. How many of you have ever heard that before? 
Yeah. Okay. Ernie. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and again, we, you know, there was lots of reasons why that diminished. I would love for that to occur. Okay. You'll be here all day. Thank you. Say, you. How could you get them exactly. to the service? Thank well, you. If you've got 80 Saturdays. people. Four pastor. <laughs> okay. So, how would you handle that? A... Boy, that means I would have to dump a few other things off my plate. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, I'm looking forward to that. And what am I focusing on? The people and their lives and the spiritual struggles that they are going through. And should that not be my highest priority? Versus, do I need to know, worry about whether the parking lot needs to get repaved or not? Mm -hmm. Do I need to worry about whether the lawnmower needs to get fixed or not? Do, do I need to worry about all these other things? No. Should I be more worried about your soul and what's the spiritual struggles that you're going through? That should be my highest priority. Doesn't so part of me would love burden? to go back to this, huh? Doesn't that, like, I just think of you hearing 80 people's burdens. How does that do for you? Yeah. That gets me excited. <laughs> oh, it no, doesn't. No, no, no. Be, know, be, I just think, oh. Be, you because too. you're you're hearing the struggles and the the answer to that struggle is God's word. And so it's giving me an opportunity saying, hey, let's go back to God's word. How does God's word speak to what you're going through right now? Hmm. Okay. Versus again, do I again do I need to worry about, you know, is the roof fixed yet? Is the grass cut? Is all the other external things that I worry about? Wouldn't it be nice just to be worried about, you know, people's souls? It's, it's almost like, you know, you go to the doctor and the doctor would rather talk about the current cub season. Uh, no, let's talk about the illnesses within my body, okay? Who cares about the current uh, cub season? And the last time I went to the doctor, I found out my, my doctor and I went to the um, uh, same uh, uh, college for my undergraduate. Oh. Yeah, I'm like, okay, well, that was a nice little point to help build connection, but let's get back to reality here. I'm standing before you. Am I healthy? Yes or no? And that's what confession and absolution provides. In the corporate nature, I don't have that opportunity to do that diagnosis, so to speak, and to apply that specific healing. I mean, let's be honest. How many times have you heard a sermon? Yeah, there was law in it. Yeah, there was a gospel, but it, it, did it really convict you? Or you're like, oh, that was kind of nice. Well, here's the opportunity for that, did it really convict you type moment. But then again, that's also the scary thing on why we don't like to do that. Okay, so yes, John. Uh, here, here's uh, one of those things about uncircumcised heart. Okay. I mean, these people are being forgiven, but... Okay, well, how about if I move on and then if it comes back to you, let me know. Okay. I have a couple other Bible passages. Are you ready? You might know this one from our liturgy, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So again, this is more focused generally about confession. But what about the individual confession? Do I need that individual confession? And the way we're going to teach it is, do you need it? Probably. Okay. Uh, am I going to force it? No. Okay. Because, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want you to, you know, again, uh, I love this, had this example of, of previous churches where, you know, parents are getting really frustrated with their teenager and they're like, pastor, you need to talk to my teenager. I'm sending my teenager into your office and don't come out until you fix my teenager. Mm, I, uh, that's not going to happen. But, you know, we, we have that mindset. Guess what? I, I cannot force confession, okay? I can ask some questions, fair enough, okay? I try to do some diagnosis. But, you know, if you're not wanting, 
it's like going to the doctor. If you're not wanting to go to the doctor, if you're not wanting to get better uh, physically, if you're just like, I'm okay, then that's fine. Then don't bother the doctor, okay? Uh, but, you know, if there's a particular problem, an issue, then let's bother the doctor, so to speak. And that's what that conf individual confession is saying, is I'm going to the pastor and saying, there's a particular issue I want to work on. Okay, great. Let me help you. And that's uh, where that comes in. Yes, John. Okay, the example, you're a Catholic and you're sitting in the confessional. Okay. You're going to hear in confessions. Uh-huh. You don't have anything posted, it's, you know, the Ten Commandments up there, right? You don't have that posted. Okay, so, go on. So you're going to, I'm just, that's probably yeah. a joke, I guess. So 10 people are there waiting Five people have committed sins that are unforgivable. What do you do with those? Well, the other five people are saints, right? You don't have any problem. After you've confessed, five people that are, are unforgiven. I'm just wondering how they feel about that. Okay, so when it comes to individual confession and absolution, this is what I teach in my junior high confirmation class as I tried to teach this concept. Should you be afraid of what the pastor is going to say? Uh. <laughs> what does this say? How bad have you sinned? <laughs> if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what I teach to my junior hires is you already know the answer. And the answer is, <gasps> you did what? I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to sit there and say, I can't wait to tell your parents about this. I'm not going to do that. If anything, any sins that are confessed to me, I am supposed to never speak about. It is part of the confessional relationship and it's part of my ordination vows. Okay, I am never to divulge any sin that is spoken to me. So you know automatically if you confess a sin to me, A, I'm not going to speak about it to anybody else. I'm going to be pronouncing Christ's forgiveness upon you. Now, John kind of brought up the scenario, well, what if they're, you know, they committed the unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin is unbelief. It's rejection of the Holy Spirit. And if they're truly rejecting the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask, why are you here then? Why do you want forgiveness if you don't believe there is a Holy Spirit? So just by the whole concept of confessing, you're implying that, you believe. I can actually show you from example in my, again, previous many years of visitors coming to the church, hearing the corporate confession of the church and being offended and never setting back foot into that church again. Because how dare you force a confession in the, in the, in the corporate confession? They are appalled at that. And I'm sitting there going, how else do we approach God? Uh, and so not all Christians are on this viewpoint. So we were very clear in our discussions to, for the Oxford Confession by saying, we're not getting rid of confession and we're still, we're also not getting rid of private confession either. Uh, let me go on a little bit more. Uh, Jesus, of course, says... Um, in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, and forgive us our trespasses and refer to the Lord's Prayer. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Uh, you know, so all these Bible passages, I will admit, I've been kind of focusing on corporate confession. Uh, what I should have done, and I forgot to bring it in here, so I apologize, is I should have gone to David's confession, King David's confession of Bathsheba and Uriah when Nathan the prophet confronted him. And notice Nathan the prophet did confront David for David's own health and spiritual welfare. Uh, and I will admit, from Nathan the prophet's point of view, this would have been very scary because David could have had Nathan the prophet just beheaded right then and there. Thanks be to God, he didn't. Okay. So that's the corp that's uh, confession. 
just to let you know, we do not get rid of private confession. We still make it available. We should probably do a better job in teaching it because of the benefit it provides you. But again, not everyone wants to have that benefit, so we're not going to command it. Okay. Uh, let's go into the next section. <clears throat> Concerning repentance. Ah, now we're going to kind of get into one of the questions that John was asking a little earlier. Uh, Article 12. Concerning repentance, it is taught that those who have sinned after baptism obtain forgiveness of sins whenever they come to repentance. Okay. And you might be thinking, aren't we just sort of stating the obvious? The answer is yes, we're stating the obvious. However, there's a reason why we need to state the obvious because not everyone's going to see the obvious. Okay. We're going to get into some of the things that others believe in a moment. But let's just pick up uh, from Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. There, Jesus is speaking, Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. So you have a strong emphasis that all sin is forgivable except for rejection of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So going back to the initial article, paragraph one, even after you have been baptized, all sin is forgivable except for rejection of the Holy Spirit. You're with me so far. Okay, let's go on to... And that absolution should not be denied them by the church. And you're going, you're, again, I'm hoping you're thinking, why would anyone want to do that? Okay. Unfortunately, there are some that have taught that once you are baptized into Christ, if you commit a major sin, how you want to define major and minor sin is up to them, not up to God's word, apparently, uh, that you can't be forgiven. What's the difference between absolution and repentance? Uh, absolution is what you receive. Repentance is kind of what you're doing. Yeah, okay. Uh, repentance is really a word that's almost impossible for some people. You're right, because we don't want to let go of our human sinful nature and pride that says, I did something wrong and I want to change. It's just, mm -hmm. You're right, we don't want to change. We want to say we're, we're good Christians and we mm -hmm. do everything right, correct? Okay, Jim, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Would you expand or put in other words rejection of the Holy Spirit? Because I'm sure it's, it's just it's more than the, the non-acceptance of the triune God. But how do you, how does somebody, I mean, Jesus became man, that's physical, but the Holy Spirit never was or is physical. I just want you to expand on that a little bit. Okay. okay. Let, let's have a little bit of fun with this. I, I mean, how does a borderline person even understand what the Holy Spirit or who the Holy Spirit is. <clears throat> okay, so how do I want to start this? There was actually, just pardon me, I'm going to change the screen for a moment. Uh, let's bring this up here. Let's have a little bit of fun here. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, we're not going to do that. Okay, we'll do it this way. I want to get to our epistle reading for today. Uh, I'm going to have to shrink this down. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, Paul here in our epistle reading for today in Romans chapter 9. Uh, let me just start by going from the top. I'm speaking of the truth of Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness uh, in the Holy Spirit. So you have a reference to the Holy Spirit. Uh, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Why? For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, 
They are Israelites, so there's, Paul is noticing there's a disconnect. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, it is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Paul begins this by saying, God's promise was given to Abraham and to his descendants, okay? And that's where it started, but he's going to go on. He then he asks, says, the word of God failed, and the answer is no. Uh, for not all who have descended from Israel belong to Israel. So now he's going to clarify something. Just because you were circumcised, just because you were born into the family, doesn't necessarily mean you belong. Whoops, that was a little bit more information than they had back in Old Testament times. They were of the mindset, if you're born into Abraham, we're good. We can do nothing wrong. If that was true, then why did God send them into exile? That was not true. They didn't quite understand, but continue on with what Paul said that they, uh, uh, for not all who were descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all uh, children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise. Ooh. So notice what Paul is doing. He's saying the DNA doesn't necessarily matter. Are you believing and trusting in the promises of God? So now let me use this as a springboard to answer Jim's question. If you're not believing and trusting in the promises of God, you are rejecting God. Okay? You could be baptized, circumcised. You could have strong lineage of Christian parents. Okay? But if you don't believe, you don't believe, plain and simple. It's by faith. So even in the Old Testament times, you were saved by God's grace through faith. Paul just articulated it, but the theology was already built and established back then. The people of Israel didn't believe that. That's why they were thrown into exile. Um, and Paul, again, is here is articulating this. So now let's bring this back to the art, uh, rejection of the Holy Spirit. Again, um, you can be in Christ through baptism. You can have received this gift of faith. Can you fall away? Can you, first of all, let me ask, can you sin? The answer is yes. And with that sin, could you ever get to the point of completely rejecting the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. And let me answer this taking your question to one other interesting point. Why is the rejection of the Holy Spirit so pivotal in this? And the answer is in the small catechism. Uh, there we go. Third article, Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Luther writes about the role of the Holy Spirit. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gift, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. So notice what this is saying is I can't believe on my own. I need God's gift of faith, gift of the Holy Spirit, to be given to me in order to believe. But if I'm rejecting the Holy Spirit, I'm rejecting that gift, I don't believe. So all other sins are forgivable because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ dies on the cross for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole entire world. However, should I reject the Holy Spirit I'm rejecting faith, and I'm ultimately rejecting God. That's why the Holy, rejection of the Holy Spirit is pivotal to this aspect of faith. Now, Jim, did I answer your question in a very long way, or did I still miss some of it? Well, I, I guess the phrase is, the unforgivable sin is rejection of the Holy Spirit. Correct. 
does that Holy Spirit refer to the third person of the Trinity? Yes. Stop there then if that's yes. So so Jews in in the time of Jesus and this especially in the first century in early writing, these Jews who did not hear Jesus' personal words of saying, I will send you the counselor, would have a very difficult time still understanding the Trinity. Correct. Well, no, they should still understand the Trinity. You have this reference of the Spirit in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. But, but they never really taught that. I, mean, they, I, 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 but, I don't think they got that. But they should have been heard of the promise and trusting the promise. So when, you, you, when you're, 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 your argument, let me see if I can try to articulate it this way. When Paul talks about the rejection of the Holy Spirit... I should say, when Jesus talks about the rejection of the Holy Spirit, sorry. Um, he is basically talking about the rejection of faith and rejection of the promise that is articulated by Jesus because the, uh, with the Holy Spirit is because Jesus is going to purposely send the Holy Spirit. Okay, you're right. At that particular time and point, the Holy Spirit was not purposefully sent because the Holy Spirit is to testify to who Jesus is. The Spirit is still out there, and you will hear about Old Testament characters being filled with the Spirit. Uh, in my devotional, we just got through reading about how Saul was filled with the Spirit and started prophesying, uh, how David was filled with the Spirit and started prophesying, and other people were filled with the Spirit and started prophesying. So the Spirit was doing this testifying to who God is, but now, more importantly, when you get to Jesus' words about the rejection of the Holy Spirit, that is talking about the Spirit testifying to him as the Savior, okay? Which is still all part of the promise. So it's still the same concept. It is just more clearly articulated by Jesus as he promises to send the Holy Spirit. Did they have the Holy Spirit so that they could believe in the promises of God back in the Old Testament times? The answer is yes. The promise was given, and they would have understood the promise given to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. They would have understood the promise that the Messiah would come, and now Jesus came, and now it's articulated as Jesus being the fulfillment of the promise. Um, keep talking, are you still? No, no, <clears throat> no, that's fine, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I live in the 21st century. Yeah, amen. You're right, <laughs> and, and now to be fair, let, let me, how's a good way of putting it? We are definitely influenced by Western education and Western culture. I'm not saying that as a negative. That is who we are. In the Hebraic culture, it's not Western thinking. Okay, so we see, we try to put ourselves into the Old Testament, and fair enough, there's nothing wrong with that, and then we start thinking, well, how would I react? Be careful with that, because you were not raised with Eastern thinking. They were raised with Eastern thinking and Eastern language skills. You start unpacking the Hebrew, and the Hebrew is very picturesque and is filled with a lot of repeating. How many times have you gotten to, not necessarily the Apostles' Creed, otherwise I'd bring up the Creed from this order of service, but like the Nicene Creed, or even the Athanasian Creed thinking, how many times you gotta say the same thing over and over again, okay? We're Western type educated people. Say it once, be done with it, move on to something else. And in the Eastern world, they're gonna sit there and go, no, this is important. You keep repeating it over and over and over again. And in the Western world, we get impatient. So we want things exact. And so sometimes we get a little frustrated with the Old Testament because it's a different way of thinking. And so part of my job is also trying to explain a little bit of this, but to sit there and say, don't worry, we're still on the same page. And don't worry for them they also still had the promises of God. It was still taught by oral tradition, 
within the families, they did a much better job in memorizing their genealogy and remember memorizing God's word. The Psalms were pretty much all memorized. We're lucky to memorize the 23rd Psalm. I guess uh, I'm looking at it very mm -hmm. simplistic, that, that yes, in God's promise, they, they knew of God the Father, that God promised I will send you the Messiah. Right. Turned out to, to be the Son, but until Jesus said, I, I will send you the counselor, and until the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was really not a physical present that I think was on the, the, the minds of early believers. Oh, okay. You're challenging me to kind of have a fun with a Bible study, and here's the topic of the Bible study. The role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And that would be a fun thing to tackle, mm -hmm. uh, but it's there. And instead of saying, trust me, how about if I say, let me work on trying to develop some of that for another Bible study, okay? You don't want to take us down a long, windy road, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, it, it, no, it's a good thing because right. I need to hear this that says, yeah, let's just spend some time because you're, you're never wasting time by spending it in God's Word. Okay, so that's why I wanted to do this with the Augsburg Confession. I wanted to focus it on God's word, not just a historical document and the theological intrigues that were going on during the time, but then again, to bring up what was the substance behind that, which of course is God's word. Okay, Janet? Maybe when you do that type of study, I still have this question in my mind, which I've spoken to you before. Where is our Holy Spirit after we die? The Bible mentions that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father, but it never mentions where is our, he's our, the Holy Spirit is our helper while we're here on this earth. Where will we see the Holy Spirit when we die? Or is that... Okay, so your body is already a temple of the Holy Spirit here and now. And the, the problem with uh, the word spirit is we can talk about the Holy Spirit. We can also talk about man's or woman's spirit, your person's spirit. Uh, so sometimes scripture uses the phrase that we are body, soul, and spirit. Sometimes the scripture uses the phrase body and soul. And so sometimes it can get a little confusing especially as us Western think type thinkers, we're like, we want it exact. Well, what is it? Is it body and soul or body, soul, and spirit? And the answer is, yeah. And we just get driven nuts over that. Um, so, um, but here, going back to the blasphemy, this is actually referring to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Do you have a, that Holy Spirit within you? The answer is yes, by God's grace through faith, okay? Uh, can you reject that? Unfortunately, uh, the answer is yes. Um, do you also have a body and soul and a spirit? Uh, you can either go again with the trichotomous, the body, soul, and spirit, or just body and soul. Either way works. But again, I'm probably going to say yes. And so there's a difference between your spirit and the Holy Spirit. And that's where we'll need to have a little bit more of a discussion. And maybe I can bring that again into the role of the Holy Spirit, especially as we focus on the Old Testament. Again, that's going to be kind of a fun one because I don't think I know of any book that does a good job of that. So I might be really challenged with that. But let me see what I can do in the next five minutes to kind of get to the end of this article so I'm not uh, uh, in the middle of repentance here, okay? Uh, so... Uh, we, we also covered that absolution should not be denied them by the church. So if somebody confesses, that's why we do not con uh, interrupt confession absolution in the divine service. You have confession of sins and then you immediately have absolution. We don't sing a hymn in between. We don't collect a second or third or fourth offering. Immediately you hear God's word of forgiveness. Coming back to Jesus, when Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 22, and when Jesus said to them, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone, the sins of any, they are forgiven, plain and simple. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, let's go on to the next three paragraphs. Now, properly speaking, true repentance is nothing else than to have contrition and sorrow and terror about sin. And yet, at the same time, 
believe in the gospel and absolution that sin is forgiven and grace is obtained through Christ. Such faith, in turn, comforts the heart and puts it at peace. Notice the tension, and we don't like tension. The tension is terror of sin and forgiveness. And we're going to continue to live in that tension. Some Christians will uh, don't like that tension, and they're like, let's not talk about sin at all. And let's only talk about the gospel. But then you don't have an appreciation of the gospel, and you're taking away the very words of God that says you're going to talk about sin. And so God's word holds us to this law and this gospel approach. Let me bring in some Bible passages. From Luke chapter 15, verse 21, a prodigal son parable. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Was there terror of the law of the heart? The answer is yes. You could see that in his words, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I don't deserve your goodness. That's terror of the heart. Verse 24, the response, for this, son, for this my son was dead, was dead, and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. So again, that shows that beautiful tension of being convicted and horrified by sin and then the beautiful gospel. And we need to maintain this tension because scripture maintains this tension. And it's not just tension. Paragraph six. Then improvement should also follow and a person should refrain from sins. For these should be the fruits of repentance, as John says in Matthew 3, verse 8, bear fruit worthy of repentance. So if you're truly terrorized by your sin, you don't want to continue to live in that terror. And so you're going to want to continue to try to avoid that sin. And picking up that Bible passage in Matthew 3, 8, just pulling the whole verse, uh, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, plain and simple. That's what it says. Fruit in re re with repentance. Now, let's me just add one other uh, Bible passage to this. From Luke chapter 19, verse 8, And Zacchaeus stood and said before the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So you have Zacchaeus then producing the fruit of repentance. And we are justified by God's grace through faith. But does that faith produce fruit? The answer is yes. Notice what we want to reject. We got a couple of these. Our churches condemn the Anabaptists who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit. So they basically say, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never leave. The... And you're like, hey, that's a good feeling never to leave. Uh, fair enough, but that's not what Scripture says. Okay. Is it possible for me to reject the Holy Spirit? Unfortunately, their answer is yes. Okay, they're going to say no. Uh, but then here's my, my favorite account. You probably already know this already in the back of your head from Mark chapter 14, verse 30. And Jesus said to Peter, truly, I tell you this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Wow. Is it possible to fall away? The answer is yes. Uh, let me get, go on with uh, paragraph eight. Uh, they also condemn those who argue that some may reach a state of perfection in this life that they cannot sin. <laughs> I haven't reached that. Uh, the Novarians, uh, no, uh, Novations uh, also are uh, condemned uh, who would not absolve those who have fallen after baptism. You know, you commit one of those major sins after you've been baptized, nah, uh, 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 you're doomed for life. Ooh, that's a little scary. Um, and so I, I'm going to bring up what Paul says. Um, 
for uh, Romans chapter 7, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. So much for perfectionism in the side of eternity. You will be perfect without sin when you're with Christ in paradise. Until then, as Paul notes, we're going to struggle with uh, sin. Um, and going back to the baptized who have fallen from Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. If your brother sins against you, condemn him and send him to hell, right? No. No, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. That's what our Confessions is trying to teach. There's a little bit more to this, but I'm running out of time. So I'm not going to finish this. I've got one more, a couple more slides, but let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Oh, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.